purely technically speaking, I have a hard time making a bear case at this particular juncture. I can I can make a corrective case um, that leads for a pullback in September, October, maybe with a volatility spike. You know, if the VIX goes above that monthly trend line that I mentioned, uh, uh, stays above it, yeah, then then things could change very quickly. You know, but it hasn't happened, and the technical position of this was was very impressive. Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder Adam Taggart. The price action in financial markets has largely ignored fundamentals all year so far. Prices have pretty much been dictated by narrative and by technical analysis. Well, what are those telling us to expect from here for the remainder of the year? For answers, we turn to technical analyst Sven Henrik of NorthmanTrader.com, who's freshly returned from a sabbatical in the Scottish Highlands. Sven, thanks so much for joining us today. Hi, Adam. Great to be with you. Yeah, Scotland was great, man. I was I was very lucky. The weather was awesome, which is rare in Scotland. So enjoy that. That's great much. to hear. Scotland's actually the first trip I ever took myself on, like with my own money at 17. I, I went out there for a couple of weeks all on my own. It was wonderful um beautiful place um i don't know if you left a couple pounds behind in scotland sven but you are looking trim my friend it's it's been a process this last year I decided to get in shape and uh actually had a running injury in may so i've been hitting the gym for a few months but getting back into running as well so i just sitting too much time on screens is not good for you so every day i try to find time to scoot out get out in nature do my thing Wow. Well, I, I get to say it's impressive, not only how it looks, but the fact that you've done that without having been able to lean on running to, to drop the pounds. I, I work out every day and you shared your uh, percentage body fat with me. Uh, and it's I'm like double where you are, brother. I mean, that's really impressive. Yeah, I mean, I, I you know, it it's it's a bizarre thing. Well, one, one thing I've done also is intermittent fasting. I usually don't eat until four or five in the afternoons. Um shifted my diet quite a bit now with the with the gym doing a lot of protein and so forth but um you know it's weird you you can retrain your body uh because we're all you know especially with the type of foods you eat you know there's so much junk out there uh processed food that just bl uh, spikes your blood sugar and then you're left with these cravings and then you you know if you're dealing with stress maybe you're sticking your head into the fridge too many times during the day it just adds up and if you don't move then not all that's up with it the intermittent fasting just works great because it it i just realized you don't really get hungry i mean you, your body adjusts and you know your your system calms down and yeah feel great that's that's the point of the whole thing. This is a whole other topic we should have at some point. Pro folks, we're going to dive into the, the market stuff in just a second here. Um, but I will say, and I talk about this a fair amount with Lance Roberts, who's on every week with me in the market recap, because Lance used to do a lot of mixed martial arts and, and ran up some gyms and has a real strong base in fitness as well. But uh, it is amazing. Like, if you really want to change your body composition, it's amazing the role that nutrition and diet play. I mean, really, if you want to change how you look, it's literally like over 80% diet more oh, than absolutely. the fitness. And absolutely. the fitness stuff's really important, but but yeah, it's the diet. Yeah, I mean, I'm like, I'm not running six hours a day to, to make things work. Yeah, I, it's, it's, it's all about balance, but uh, the yeah, diet is, is the key ingredient. And it, it's amazing to me how much we subconsciously become slaves to the habits and again the the, the food composition and uh, once you can free yourself of that it's just a completely different ball game you know so it, i'm enjoying it it's fun well good on you your your inner viking is is has become your outer viking here it's very clear to see now great great work um all right well look um lots of questions here for you um Sven, and and I know we did a little talk in the pre-recording here. Um, you, you've got some, I think, really interesting observations that that might surprise some people here. We'll talk about in just a moment. To kick things off, though, let me just ask my general question. I like to kick these interviews off with: um, What is your current assessment of the global economy and financial markets? Well, it depends on who you want to believe, I suppose. I mean, according to the Atlanta Fed, we're just the greatest economy ever, right? <laughs> we have three GDP now cast at 5.6%, just ticked down from 5.9%. The St. Louis Fed has a similar 
type GDP now model out there at minus 0.07%. Oh, they're all over the map. Um, and But the fact is we're not in a recession at this moment. Uh, China is in a bit of trouble. And I think that's something that we may want to address at some point as well during the discussion. Uh, clearly, they've they've stepped away from the standard type of stimulus that we've seen in the past, but their growth figures are slowing hard. Commercial real estate, everything else is 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 challenging. In the U.S., I would argue, um, you know, we've talked about lag effects uh, that from aggressive rate hikes, and I think they've kind of surprised everyone a bit in the sense that they haven't really hit as dramatically as maybe one would have thought by now. I've always said 12 to 18 months, so we're still kind of in this window. Um, I it, I see it having impacts in, in some areas, but in others, not really yet. And I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples here. One is the fact that, and it's been cited quite a bit this summer, that a lot of U.S. consumers are sitting on extremely low rate mortgages. And we, we're coming out of a unique experiment from 13, 14 years of free money and low mortgage rates. And so people have locked in these rates, which has some interesting ramifications and new dynamics for the housing market in this cycle because the incentive to sell the house is just simply not there because who wants to lose their cheap mortgage and buy a new house with a much higher mortgage so, so the housing market got very much supply constrained which is a massive problem for anyone else that wants to buy a house because they can't afford it um and and so the fed in a way has you know created a monster here because yeah, a they supported the you know, mortgage-backed securities during the COVID years just piled in into a supply-constrained housing market back then already. And now prices have not come down the way they probably should have at this point. So that the housing market's kind of dead in that sense. It's it's kind of in a weird equilibrium. But as long as as long as people can hold on, and that's quite a, a lot of millions of people sitting on low mortgages, they can weather the storm a bit longer than you would think. The same is also true for corporate debt. You know, corporations were very smart to lock in a lot of cheap rates. Now, it's true this year, next year, in 25, 26, the, the maturities are coming online and, and they're going to have to also refinance at, at higher debt. But the, the impact hasn't really been felt yet dramatically. And, and typically, this is what you see. Uh, which then causes margin pressure and that leads to layoffs. And so in, in that sense, maybe you're looking at a bit of an unusual runway in terms of how these lag effects filter through the economy. So I think we just need to be all aware of that. And then thirdly, um, you know, I've seen a lot of talk about excess savings being drained, right? From the from the post-COVID checks and everything else. So there's a lot of Concerns or well, what 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 happens to consumers with the excess savings drained, and then of course you know the the student loans coming back. So there's a lot of doom and gloom on that, which is I think justified because we don't know exactly how this will impact the consumer. But there's a counter to that as well, which is in the last year and a half we saw nothing but negative wage growth, okay, and. 25 consumers consecutive were, months of it, just FYI. Yeah, absolutely massive. And, you know, A, never seen anything that dramatic, right? But, you know, partially maybe driven by the fact that um, we had these year-over-year -year anomalies anomalies with, with the, the post-COVID excess. Uh, but still, it's, it's typically when you see negative wage growth that pervasive, that dramatically, you're in a recession, Right. But now something interesting is happening, right? Right as the excess savings are coming off the so-and-so quote-unquote balance sheet here, if you will, real wage growth is turning positive. Quite a bit, actually, as inflation is coming down and wage pressures have moved wages up quite a bit. And all of a sudden, the consumer may be able to handle that transition better than anyone would expect. Yeah, obviously this is predicated on inflation continuing to come down. And if you look at oil prices screaming back up, the dollar going back up, there's there's definitely risk factors out there that 
you know, on the service side, uh, that may keep, you know, the Fed on the higher for longer game for a while, right? Until something breaks, right? But the point is, there's there is maybe potentially this runway, um, to support equities for quite some time. In fact, I I can maybe highlight one chart here in this regard, and it's the one year chart. Um, uh, you know, one year is, is massively higher vis-a-vis uh, -vis anything we've seen since 2008 or 2009, right? I mean, it's it's been low uh, for for years. But if you look at this in context of these past cycles, here's a 50-year chart. I'm just, you know, here's a bit of history for everyone. Uh, every single time, except one, okay, we're talking about, I think, eight or nine incidences here. Every time the, the, the one year gets to a point where it peaks uh, and then rolls over from its peak, markets are actually doing quite well, historically speaking, which kind of surprised me as well, right? And, you know, for example, obviously we know about the famous Fed pause in 2006 uh, and markets made, went on to make new all-time highs in 2007. That was a period of about a, year and a half, two years, actually, before things turn really gnarly. In 2000, it was more imminent, but markets still made new highs. Uh, and then, of course, you go back to the 80s, uh, 90s, and, and so forth. There was really only one incident, was, which was early 1980s, where you had a rollover, and that was bad for markets, because again, that 81, 82 period. But even in the 70s, if you look at that, uh, that other inflation period, you know, when, when the two-year rolled over, markets flew higher. Uh, and I, I think that's kind of a historical segue where you're going to have to say, okay, what does this mean for this cycle? You know, given what I've outlined on the economy, maybe there is a runway for markets to do the unexpected, which is scream higher. I'm just, I'm just putting it out there. It, it's so interesting. And since we're looking at this chart, um, I'll just interject for a second. So, you know, we have people saying, Gosh, look at look at the yield of the T bill, right? <laughs> like, like you know, the the equity premium is really low. I think it's the lowest it's been in so like twenty years or something like that. I think I heard recently. So there's a lot of people saying, "Hey, money's going to start fleeing." Understandably, fleeing the stock market for the safety, the relative safety and, and and attractive risk return offering that bonds offer, specifically safe sovereign bonds. But what you're saying is is the historical data doesn't really necessarily say that's the case, or if so, it acts with a pretty big lag. Yeah, and, and you know, maybe I'm speculating and I'm off base here, which is always possible. But you know, I'm wondering if I'm looking at this chart here now and I see you know yields coming down, well, then the incentive to hold yield-based instrument diminishes, and then money goes back into the stock market. Right. That right. And, it, and is that what it is? Maybe it's it's peaking. And as it comes off, that money rushes in the stock market for some period of time, sending stocks higher. Some period of time un until, you know, the ultimate break when it then really rolls over. That's when you have the recession. Right. I mean, this this is when the Fed cuts rates and so forth. So I'm, not, I'm not saying it's it's an ultimate positive, but I'm saying in setting this up in terms of a potential runway um, th that gives markets still maybe six months, year and a half, who knows? I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not a wizard here calling for timing. I'm just observing the historical reality here is that in eight out of nine instances, this was initially very bullish market still before okay. things rolled over into a recession. Well, so and, I think and, we just, I, I think we just need to be all humble about the possibility that this, this could still happen here as well. It's a very important warning for those that are expecting an imminent rollover in the markets. You're saying this is a fairly consistent data series that shows ah, we, we just don't necessarily see it under these conditions historically. Um, th because the one year is such a short duration, it, it, it's pretty it's pretty uh, correlated with changes in the Fed funds rate, right? In other words, when, when the Fed hikes or lowers the Fed funds rate, the, the one year moves pretty quickly with that, right? Yeah, I mean, it, it just look at two thousand six, two thousand seven. Once it peaked, that was in, that was when the Fed had paused its rate hike cycle, 
right? It just didn't do anything until it was forced to in 2008, right? When everything fell apart. Yeah. Uh, so the, the, the one year actually held fairly steady. But in that time frame, look what markets did. <laughs> they kept going up. Yeah. You know? Uh, and, and and it's really not until you got a massive break in the labor market. And, you know, going back to the corporate debt, you know, as long as as, as long as they can, you know, manage their their margins and, and refinancing is not a massive issue for them quite yet. Um, and demand is holding up, i.e. positive wage growth vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, the other factors we, we mentioned. In terms of student loans or excess savings, again, I'm, I just got to look at it in terms of runway. Um, and markets like to run un, until they don't, right? So, and I hate to say this, maybe I need to, the next chart I need to bring up and just kind of give everybody kind of a head washing. And I, I'm not trying to upset anyone. I'm just trying to be as stoic uh, and, and analytical about all this as I can be. But it's a basic S&P seasonality chart, which is absolutely mind-boggling in context of everything that's going on this year. Because, you know, we've been looking at this, not in terms of percentage moves, but in terms of directional pivots. And... It's it's amazing how just relevant it remains to this day. I mean, look at this very basic March bottom, right? Then a rally into May and then chop May, June. That, that's kind of what we saw. Then a massive rally into July, which we had this year, right? We had a massive rally into the end of July. And then, then it called for a modest pullback in August. 6%, that's what we got on the S&P. And then a rally back into early September. Guess what? That's just what we saw. And if you just look at this chart and nothing else, what it suggests, and my, my view on these things is, you know, they, they work until they don't, but as long as they work, they're relevant, right? And if you look at this, you can make the case, okay, well, maybe in, into mid-September, we'll see another big squeeze, that may or may make new highs vis-a-vis -vis July or not. And then we're going to see some shakiness, you know, vis-a-vis -vis September, October. And then guess what? This thing is going to get bought into year end, um, which is then when I'm looking at this on a basic level and then dig into the market, how the market's been acting here during July, August, uh, I find it really interesting that this, this this August correction was very unique in, in, in a particular sense. So I wanted to walk you through a couple of charts to highlight that because it's it's quite fascinating uh, and it's it's got me thinking. Okay, so first of all, let me just highlight one chart, which is... Real quick, Sven, before we go there, I just want to make sure it's probably obvious, but I want to make sure folks understand this chart we're looking at here, the seasonality, this is a composite over the past 20 years of S&P behavior, right? And what you're saying is, is 2023 is playing out practically exactly according to this average trajectory. So- Yeah, and it's the not the percentage. It's the, the percentages I, I don't find particularly helpful in this chart. What I find helpful and have found helpful so far this year is, is the directional pivots. For example, we had a peak in February. Uh, and and for us, when we looked at the signals at the time, that was you know we we've been bullish coming out of October, and now we said okay we'll test a short, and and that worked. And then it said bottom in March. Well, guess what happened? I mean you you, you can make you can scratch your head about it. Obviously, this was when the banking crisis happened, and they they intervened with a BTFP program, uh, and that was the bottom in markets. Boom, back, massive rally, right? And that continued into July. So these these pivots have been working like a charm so far this year. And and it's you know it's so basic, but it works. And it has but been it works. So I just want to underscore based on this, if the correlation holds for the remainder of the year, there's a very big pivot that's should come in October and basically have the market run to the end of the year, which for you know the many people who are worried by a lot of the macro stuff that you mentioned at the beginning of the discussion here and are thinking, well, surely this market's long in the tooth and is going to roll over. You're just waving a flag and saying, hey, maybe, but 
the seasonality correlation has been holding really tightly. And if it does, prepare yourself. This thing may just run higher into the end of the year from mid-October. Yeah, I mean, look, we, we've been looking at this chart all year long, and we can just keep visiting it on, on key pivots and say what, you know, our, our main philosophy on this one is, well, we can argue with it or we can make money of it, right? And so as long as it tracks, consider it relevant and of interest, right? And the, the next test right now was here in August coming off of July peak, and it, it played beautifully. Because by the by the end of August, it says there was going to be a, a big bounce into month end, and and now what it basically says, well, we're going to be chopping here in the first part of September, maybe with a little pullback here and there, but then into OPEX mid month, see another squeeze higher, and then we see right. So that that's just that's not even a technical chart. This is just a basic seasonality chart. You know, no no other no other value added to that. It's just the market is repeating all this, uh, very conspicuously, accurately. I, I you know I, I'm not arguing with it. I'm just saying that's that's what's been happening. You're just saying so it far, is what it is, right? And as I'd like to remind is. people, yeah, we we you know we we, we this the whole whole reason for this channel is to help us look at all the data that we can and try to get a bit best sense of where the puck is headed. But sometimes that puck goes in directions that we, you know, logically might not want it to go, right? But as we as we remind people, we have to deal with the markets, we have to trade the markets we have, not the markets we wish we have, right? And you're just saying, good or bad, <laughs> this is how the script has been unfolding all year so far. Absolutely. And, you know, let, let me move Trent, the market discussion to some observations about this particular pullback in August and how it unfolded and how it then fit in with the rally into the seasonal chart for early September rally. Um, I'll, I'll start with one, a, a basic one that probably all of us have questioned at point, some point this year, um, and that's the VIX. Um, if, if you can pull that one up, um, you know, for us, for, for many of us, I think we all kind of considered the VIX to be dead ever since the zero day option trading has begun and even last year you know i kept pointing out that with successive new lows on the s&p the vix just kept making lower highs and i remember in october a lot of people talking about the vix you know you don't have a bottom until the vix hits at least 45 this that and the other and that's all historically true but it just simply didn't happen and we had that one little spike this year during the bank crisis and it didn't even quite hit the trend line and it just got bumped and not only did it get thumped consecutively in these recent months, it broke the uptrend from 2017. It's been a consistent uptrend. So if you have, for any of us who are expecting you know, the resurgence of volatility, you were sorely disappointed. I mean, you know, we're making, all making fun of VIX crush Fridays and this, that, the other. But the fact is, uh, volatility, we've moved into a low volatility market regime. And so all of us were kind of saying, okay, well, maybe the VIX, you know, I know there's a lot of people who doubt you can chart the VIX anyway, but, you know, we've, from my perspective, proven that differently year after year after year. But frankly, we were challenged on this as well. And so when the August correction happened, there was a big test in, in our minds whether the VIX was still technically relevant. And that was on the lows August 18th. Uh, my wife, who is always tracking the VIX, she sent me a chart I share with clients, and it was fascinating. On the day of the lows, the VIX was approaching that broken trend line. And that was kind of the moment we said, okay, this is now a show me moment. Is the VIX still relevant? Is it not? And if it's relevant, then technically it would reject that trend line. I, mean, I actually posted those charts on my, my Twitter feed as well. And guess what? The VIX hit that trend line I mean, so precisely, so cleanly, and then just got absolutely monkey hammered down. So, you know, I, I can argue with it. Anyone can argue with it. But the fact is, that's what it did. I mean, just it just tagged it and got rejected hard. And, you know, we've been rallying ever since from, from that August 18th low. It's been pretty impressive. Now, having said all that, you know, on Friday, uh, it's closed around 13. 
you know, do do I feel comfortable saying the VIX is going to stay low here in September and October? No, I'm I'm not. Uh, I would probably expect some volatility come back in. But I think the main message of this chart now is the big bull bear divide line is that trend line. For bears to really break this market, you need to get above that trend line and stay above it. Otherwise, you got nothing. You have absolutely nothing. I mean, this this was a big test for this market. And you know, if you wanted to see who was in control, bang, bulls. Because volatility, again, pulled off of that trend line. Amazing to see. Well, and I'm just curious, Sven, because I know folks are going to ask this. We've talked about it a little bit in the few previous videos. Um, it, it was the start of this year, right, where um, zero uh, data expiration options started trading. Is that? It was last year. It was last year. It was in, last I think year. It was last year, and, and, and maybe correlate that with the lower VIX ever since, right? The, the lower highs in the VIX. Yeah, I mean, do, do you think that that is playing a role here in the depression of VIX? And if so, how big of a role? I, I have no doubt that these zero-day options compress intraday market action, for example. Um, I, the, the program nature of it, especially on Fridays, is is all inspiring you just, you know, we, we can look at, you know, all kinds of macro things, but we also need to be aware of what's going on in the market structures, uh, what's driving markets, what's technically relevant. And uh, I hate to say it, but this this has made a difference in terms of how markets act. Um, but what we have seen also uh, this year with the summer rally, I would argue is not unlike what we've seen in the past six years. In fact, if you pull up a chart, my rally chart, I'm going to give everyone a head washing here, including myself, because I I, I looked at this and uh, you know it, it it's kind of eye opening. Um, over the last six years, we've seen seven what I would call stupid rallies. Okay, let me define what I mean by stupid rallies. These are rallies that go on and on and on and on, and anyone's trying to fade them is going to get run over or is going to get frustrated. Um, and and for the purpose of this chart here, I've just highlighted uh, some key phases. For example, 2017, when we had the tax cuts, what do you see? Every every week, the S&P is tagging the upper weekly Bollinger Band. Basically, the weekly five EMA holds its support and it just goes on and on and on. We, got, we saw that in 2018. Obviously, we saw that with the Fed flip-flop in 2019. We saw that when they expanded the balance sheet in 2020. Then, of course, we had the COVID crash, and we all know what happened after that. The dumbest rallies ever. And even last year, you know, during this bear phase, if you want to call it that, you know, you, you had these intermittent counter rallies. But this rally here this summer looks pretty much the same what we've seen in these previous years. And if you look at the red boxes, bears, sorry to say, your time frame, your, your, your play time is significantly shorter. It's nasty than what British and short, right? <laughs> It's it's all you get. I mean, even even last year. I mean, the, the, supposedly the biggest bear face since two thousand nine. You know, the 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 red boxes were pitiful compared to the size and length of these blue boxes. I mean, we just came out of five months straight up. What do you think would happen if the market went down for five months straight? That that just be revolution or bloodness, and it doesn't happen. I mean, even even the biggest rallies that come, and some of them have, you know, then ultimately corrections, you know, because the market just barfs itself into just ridiculous readings and technical extensions, and then you get these pullbacks. Some are, you know, more shallow; others are more dramatic. But just look at the COVID crash, Adam. The, 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 how tiny is that red box? It's incredibly to, skinny. Yeah, it is very skinny. So you have the biggest crash, what, since 1987, <laughs> and it's over in a heartbeat, right? And then, of course, everything melts right back up, and we know why in Dimension City. I'm just saying, this is this chart, you know, and I've, I've, been, I've been dealing with these rallies on the sell side a few times, and it's, you know, that's what I'm saying. 
you know, tops are processes, bottoms are events. But I'm I'm just saying that the the entire market structure for years has been favorable to these really intense rallies that go on and on and on, and and pretty much force either capitulations, uh, and then of course you know when when people do want to short, you know they're they're gonna be forced to cover really soon again. It's just there's just the, the, the time of actually holding a long-term short is simply not there. You got to be reactive to the signals uh, and, and obviously what's what's happening on the, on the policy front. In fact, not to depress every bear to hell, but we should put up the yearly chart, okay, if you, if you can do that. Guess how many yearly red candles there have been in the last 82 years? 22, 22 yearly red candles, okay? And 16 out of these 22 were in context of simply one year events that either dipped below the five EMA, the yearly five EMA, or held at the five EMA, okay? And then ended up rallying further. Out of those 82 years, and basically the message is since World War II, we've been in this just insane bull market. In 82 years, there have been only two periods, two, where the S&P showed two or more years of down in a row. That was in the 1970s, and that was with the tech bubble crash. And I highlighted a few kind of other periods here, which are fascinating to me. One is COVID, biggest crash since 1987. And guess what? It was never a down year. Mm -hmm. it, it just dipped below the five EMA and it held a support. The, the global financial crisis, which was brutal, was massive, one down year. That was it. It was just literally one down year, which was 2008. The bottom was made in 2009, and then we ripped back above the yearly five EMA, and it's held every single time since. 2022, the big bear market, guess what bottom? Yearly five EMA, held, okay? The 1987 crash, we all know about the 1987 crash. It was so dramatic. Guess what it did? It just tagged the yearly five EMA, and that was a bottom. That was it. So I, I hate to say it because, you know, I've been on that train a number of times myself, but this is kind of my, my, my bears are idiots chart. I hate to tell you this. The, the, the odds of getting consecutive down years is just really low, you know, because markets just simply go up 75, 80% of the time, if you look at these stats. Uh, and of course, since the age of intervention, they've really made sure we never drop below the five year mark. Yeah, they go. I mean, and if we do, they get saved, you know. So, I mean, th this is the history. Now, you can argue with it, or you cannot, but you know that that's that's what it is. You know, the, yeah. the, the, these times are really rare. And so, in that context, what just happened last year was just like one of these other fifteen prior events where you had a one yearly red candles, and then the market just moved higher. And if you put that in context of the seasonality chart, it, it can happen, right? Just yeah. got to be aware of that. This reminds me of the old Peter Lynch saying, and for those who don't know who Peter Lynch was, he was a very successful money manager in what, the 80s and 90s, uh, running the Magellan Fund. Um, but he said, uh, there's been more money lost my people basically staying out of the market or placing short bets uh, in preparation of the next market crash, then we're actually lost in the next market crash, right? Because, you know, people are are playing for a probability that you're saying, if you look at the data, it's actually, it's a much smaller probability, right? You just don't get that many down years to begin with. And you certainly don't get that many back to back down years. Yeah, and I have to be intellectually honest with myself as well, which is you know, like, look at last year it was from, from a bear perspective, you can argue it was fantastic, right? But then, then I look, you know, at, at what we actually did, um, you know, because we, we always look at both directions and, you know, June lows, it said by August, uh, October lows, it said by, that's what the technicals were saying. And despite having caught a few nice shorts, 
you know, more money was made on the long side last year than on the short side, which I find fascinating because in when you do have these bear markets, you still get these rip roaring bear market rallies, right? I mean, we saw that from June into the August highs. It was absolutely brutal again on, on the counter trend side. So again, that was a point where it just didn't make sense to stay short because you just got all your gains evaporated, right? It, it, bears always have to be kind of paranoid and, and really flexible. I'm not saying there's not times to short, but as I showed with that earlier chart about these mega rallies, it's a really frustrating process. And these rallies can just absolutely drive you mad. And then when there is short or downside in markets, as I show with that chart as well, the, the, the time window is really limited. You know, and, and that's why I kind of want to go into what just happened in August, which I found incredibly fascinating um, in terms of how that unfolded. So may the first chart to show there is BPNDX. It's kind of bullish percentage indicator on, on, on the NASDAQ. It is one of many signal charts we, we watch on a regular basis. And that one had me kind of head scratching um, because in August, you know, if you look at the top line, it's the RSI, the relative strength index. It came down to the lowest level most oversold level since October of 2021. That was an extreme reading. It was more extreme than anything that we saw in 2022, which was a much more price aggressive range, wider range type market. You know, with the S&P down 6%, all of a sudden you see the most oversold reading in in nearly two years, you kind of scratch your head. This is like, you know, this is not really a place you want to be staying short, right? This is the place you want to start looking at buying. And then, you know, just looking at the structure, how the decline unfolded on the bottom part of the chart, you know, it was basically a falling wedge. Also what we saw in October of 2021. Um, and basically what that chart did then, obviously the, it did the rally, counter rally that followed didn't stop until the RSI went back to 72. Now I can't say if the same thing is going to happen here again, but I'm just noting the similarity. Um, the other thing that happened, which is actually a lot more dramatic, was if you look at the NASDAQ oscillator, the volume oscillator chart, uh, because that was mind blowing. Uh, if you can pull that up, it reached an oversold reading uh, of a level that we hadn't seen um, more than, I think, seven times in the last 10, 12, 13 years. I mean, it, it was extreme. And <laughs> you, you, you ask yourself, okay, all right, let's, let's have our limited data set. Actually, if you, it goes back to 2006, this chart. We had it in 2010, 2012, 2016, that kind of thing. And each time it ended up being a major bottom. It was not a time to short. I guess you can argue in 2010, it chopped around in that lower price range for a little bit. But basically, you know, it got down to a level of a minus 130, extremely rare reading. You know, we, we saw it once last year, that was a buy. We saw it in a few times in these previous years, each time it was a buy. The, the baffling thing here on this one was the VIX, because typically when you see an oversold reading like that, you see a big VIX spike. And we didn't see that, right? Because the VIX just tagged that trend line I mentioned earlier and it rejected. That was it. So from if you look at this, it, it's kind of weird to say that a 6% pullback resulted in such dramatic oversold reading readings and there's actually one chart that may explain a little bit as to why and that's the asset manager index that that's that's a classic kind of a maybe sentiment gauge in terms of how rallies unfold uh you know in july i, I was putting out this coming correction uh, northcast where i talked about some of these extreme readings on the overbought side and, and one of them was you're talking about, I put a tweet out on this, that the asset manager index just 
massively piled in, into levels we hadn't seen basically since the 2022 top. I mean, this, this, this is what these big stupid rallies do and they force asset managers to pile in the FOMO, the capitulation. That that was that was the warning sign because we just got really overbought again on negative divergences and they pile in. But what's fascinating to me is you know the six percent pullback on the S and P. Look how they barfed out of the, their positions. They got to the lowest exposure in all of 2023 by the end of August. And, and and that typically ends up to be a major contrarian signal. Why? Because, you know, if they're expecting a big, massive correction or bear market and it's not happening, and then they're forced to pile back in, right? That's your basic performance anxiety. But considering the, the dramatic nature of this turnaround, I'm actually amazed that the S&P only dropped 6%. Mm you would have thought it would have dropped a lot more on that. It didn't. And so I guess we all have to ask ourselves why that is, right? It, it should have. And, and the second point I guess I would make here is that now they're still not fully positioned again. So if everybody is expecting a big September, October correction, but it's not happening, and then you have the context of the seasonality chart, if that still plays, they're forced back in. Yeah, you get like a big short squeeze or just everyone who's been on the sidelines has to start jumping back in to chase the performance. That's that's the danger. So I'm I'm you know I, I can't predict this obviously, but I'm I'm just noting the behavior. Uh and you, you see them piling back in here at the end of the month because they have to. <laughs> so a, a lot of that is happening. And and I, I want to highlight this also in context of BPSVX, which um, like this asset manager index was really interesting in terms of the July, August timeframe. Sorry to make you jump hoops here with these charts, but I think they're really important to noodle through. BBSPX actually did something very unusual on both ends of the spectrum. And that is in July, when, every, when these asset managers piled in, the RSI got to the same level it was before the 2020 COVID crash. It was extreme. It was like the most overbought RSI I had only seen in these two timeframes. Very impressive. That, so that was a massive warning sign in July, hence expecting some sort of correction. But then the, the velocity with which this then dropped to the most oversold rating since 2019, uh, was just as impressive because again it was it was more was sold than it was at any time in 2022. Again, this is where your charts are screaming you can't stay short. You know, the rally is coming, and what's also interesting is that we never got to below the 100 MA. We dropped below the 50 MA, but the 100 MA held, and and so now it gets really weird, Adam. All right. Hmm. Because I did this study and I put out this North cast called Mega Bull. All right. And I was looking at the NIMO, which is another chart you should have a look at. Um, the NIMO got also very oversold in August. It got close to a minus 100, it was like minus 93, minus 94. Um, and several things to say about that. NIMO is there's another oscillator technical signal. And typically the way I look at it is the best lows come when the NIMO makes a higher low vis-a-vis -vis the S&P making a new low. That's called a positive divergence, but it's not always necessary, okay? So we had quite a few of these readings last year during this bear phase, uh, got into minus 80s. We got in, in, in September, I guess we got to minus 120. In March, during the banking crisis, we got to about minus 110. But this mi not minus 94 reading in this context is maybe just, you can say, well, it's kind of the same range, no big deal. But actually, it turns out it is a big deal, at least in my analysis, because it happened in August, uh, which is really unusual. I mean, we've seen corrections in august before but 
you see extreme negative Nile readings in August, I found to happen, oddly enough, every four years. It, it happened in 1999. It happened in 2003. It happened in mm. 2007. It happened in 2011. It happened in 2015 and happened, as I mentioned before, in 2019. What are all these years? These are presidential pre-election years. Every single one of them. And I'm like, really? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, going back to seasonality chart, like, right, you know, maybe we're just all part of a script unconsciously uh, because you really don't find August readings on NIMO that low. I, I, I will say there was one exception, which was 2014, and markets just rallied like a bastard into year end. But every single one of these, going back to 1999, were all presidential pre-elections years. And what happened with a NIMO reading like this? We got a bounce into September, basically what we're seeing now. Then you got another pullback in September, October, similar to the seasonality chart. Yep. Some of these years made a basically created a retest of the August lows. Some made a higher low. Some made a marginal new low. And that was it. That was it. Basically, they all were a buy, every single one of them. Now, I'm not saying these are long-term necessarily good news market structures, because in 1999, we know what happened, right? We made new all-time highs in, in March 2000, and then ultimately a recession came in Hellboro. In 2007, you know, actually, ironically, there was no September, October pullback. There, there really wasn't. There were like a couple of down days here and there. Anyone that was expecting a big fat correction in September and October... They got slammed with new all-time highs in October, right? Before things rolled over. Okay, so markets sometimes do unusual things. And even 2019, right? We just chopped around for a little bit and then just rallied into year end as well. So I'm just I'm just highlighting these historical examples to say first they're unusual to see an August Nimo reading this low, to get oversold readings on BPNDX, BPSBX, and so forth of extreme natures that we haven't seen in years, which is kind of bizarre given the context. And so now we're finding asset managers not fully exposed and the market's still oversold. And what does that mean, right? I mean, that, that to me tells me that seasonality chart I mentioned earlier certainly has potential to play out until something breaks. And I want to, on that note, I want to highlight one more chart uh, in terms of this rally, junk. Junk, been watching this all year long. It's it's one of those important health measurement sticks for what's actually going on in markets and the economy. It's high yield credit, right? And junk was dealing with resistance quite a bit last year and in february of this year you can see it those those green circles very clear resistance and every time i rejected from there you see how close the s p tracks with junk uh it's been going on for the last couple of years very very clearly correlated and then something odd happened it was in in during the june july rally when junk didn't really participate to me, that was a warning sign, right? I said, well, this, this rally is doing its thing, but we don't have confirmation from high yield. So that tells me we should expect a correction. That kind of fit the whole picture of correction coming mode. Um, but I also said at the time that when the correction then does unfold, then we got to watch signals very clearly and see what they tell us. And, and junk was one of those signals because Bears at that moment had every excuse and opportunity with the dollar rising, with yields going back up to break the uptrend in high yield credit. And guess what? It didn't. I mean, look at that pink line. It's the uptrend of junk from October of last year. It tagged it perfectly, bounced from there, not only bounced from there, but made a new high for the year. What does that tell you? So 
you know, if, if you're expecting a big bear market move of any sort, you need to see that uptrend breaking with vigor. And it, and it didn't happen, which surprised me. I have to say it surprised me. But we were watching this the whole entire process. And I said, I just, I just don't see it. I just don't see it breaking. It, it, and, and I can ask course, this question. That I, 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 yeah. I've been biting my tongue not to get into macro while you've been going through the TA. Yeah. But junk is now the highest it's been since April of 2022. Yeah. And yet interest rates are, you know, vastly higher than they were back then. Um, what's the rationale for piling into junk now? You know, I, I, I'm not trading it, so I, I can't give anyone any advice what they're doing or not doing. Uh, I'm just observing the, the price action. Um, yeah, I, I, that you, you mentioned high yields. You know, we we the ten year yield got to the levels of last year, September, right? That was that was when the ten year was screaming. That's when the market was tanking, and we just had a big massive retest of that. And you would have thought that the market would be more concerned about that, i.e., the one year yield being so high, mm -hmm. but it's not. It 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 we're we're far above. From where we were in October, obviously, um, and so in in that sense, the market's been taking all this in stride. Now, you know, if something were to massively happen, uh, and and these things scream higher, then yeah, I would expect any bullish conviction to get severely tested, and maybe that'll maybe that's the trigger for a September October uh, corrective type move, as we've seen in all these other presidential pre election years. Um, but the the fact that you now not do not see the same reaction as you did last year says something, doesn't it? I mean, that, that's talk about market pricing things in. The the other one's kind of odd was the dollar. I mean, we had a very consistent correlation, and, and as of late, the dollar was screaming higher, and that pressured equities into August, and then the dollar got very overbought and all of a sudden pulled back. I didn't bring a chart for that, but it pulled back for the 20 MA and markets rallied with it. And this morning, you know, the dollar had rallied again, again, related to China as well, uh, weakness in China. And yet markets are kind of brushing it off. I and mean, we're down a little bit, but nothing, nothing dramatic. You would have thought with a new high in the dollar for the year, you know, we would see major volatility. Haven't seen right. it. At, this point uh which kind of brings me to you know a couple of really polar opposite examples okay so one is staying on this kind of bullish theme uh, I'm, I'm looking at a couple of international equities the FTSE in uk is is a good one to look at because the FTSE, obviously being based in the uk is struggling the most with inflation in the western world um, because obviously they also have Brexit related issue and so forth. Um, growth has been not great at all, but I'm just looking at this technically and the FTSE was baffling right off the bat earlier from the, uh, the lows in 2022, because it actually went to make an all time new high here in 2023. It's like, why in the world is it doing that? Mm -hmm. And since then, you know, it's been pulling off. And it's been shopping in this wide range of lower highs and lower lows. Well, before you know it, you can make a case this is a big ass bull flag. You know, it's not confirmed, it's not broken out, but look where it's trading. Yeah, you know, it's sure beginning it's, to look like one. Yeah. It's starting to begin to look like one, which makes me, you know, kind of question a lot of things. You know, the, the DAX made a new all-time high this year as well, and now it's chopping around as well. I'm just putting this in context of this year-end seasonality chart. Now, China, that that's just been awful, right? I mean, the the if you put up the Hang Seng, uh, and and not to be all rose-colored here at all, but here too, I can maybe make the case of the unexpected, because uh, everybody's negative on China these days, right? And I. I'm not particularly 
you know, convicted on this pattern at all. I'm just noting it and I'm kind of watching it because it, it, it looks all rather dreadful. Uh, but China got hammered hard, obviously, in the last few years. They are in a lot of trouble, but they're also under a lot of pressure to make things better, right? And if this plays as an inverse, which I we don't have any confirmation, this is completely speculative on my part, but if this were to play as an inverse, what do, what do you think is going to happen to markets in general, right? Yeah. Um, now, for, for those big... that might be listening on a podcast and not seeing the screen here, uh, Sven has has marked up the recent action of the Hang Seng, and it looks like a potential head and shoulders, inverse head and shoulders pattern, which means if it completes, you would expect the Hang Seng to really rocket higher once this formation is complete. Yeah. I mean, look, I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat cautious on this pattern myself because the right shoulder is a bit lower than the left one. But I'm, I'm noticing it's holding support kind of in this general area. They do have, a, they're under a, the gun to do something. I mean, they started cutting rates here a little bit. You know, they're trying to cut taxes here a little bit. But none of that has so far really propelled things high. But we're talking about the second largest economy in the world. And, you know... I would not be surprised if that ultimately they did not something more dramatic. That is it's just, you know, it's out there. I mean, this could also easily invalidate in, in with a September, October correction, this pattern. I'm just putting this out as a potential one um, that, that could blow anyone's mind in terms of how the price action could unfold into, into next year on, on this, right? Now I don't want to be all rose-colored glasses here. I can I can make a couple of very interesting observations. I think in terms of the bear side. So before you guys, you know, accuse me of being now permeable, <laughs> uh, let me highlight a couple of interesting charts. One is the DJW, as it's the global Jones. Um, that has been very clean this year as well, and what it shows is a massive rising wedge that actually broke in August. And what we're seeing at this particular point with this rally into September, we're seeing a back test of that wedge. You can you can see it. I, hadn't, I mean, ju adjusted the trend lines in, in months. It just did that. So you can maybe make the case, well, maybe this is our on the tail end of it is kind of sort of head on shoulders. It broke the trend and that's suggestive of maybe something really bad could happen. Possible. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm keeping an eye on, on that one as well. In fact, it's going back to what I mentioned about all these presidential pre-election years with the ni negative NIMO reading in August being so bad. Uh, there was another famous presidential pre-election year, which was 1987. Uh, and that's kind of fascinating to look at just, you know, again, analogs, they work until they don't. Um, but if, if you look at 1987 vis-a-vis -vis kind of what we're seeing at this particular moment in time, uh, you, you'll notice some similarities here uh, in, in context of the price action. Um, the... The first to notice here is that, of course, then we had also a big rally into the summer. And then an August kind of September type of correction that stopped before the daily 100 MA. And then it bounced from there. And when that bounce occurred, you know, people were getting bullish again, da, 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 da. There was no new high that came at that moment. Okay. And it tagged the upper daily Bollinger Band and then it rolled over. And that, you can argue that's kind of what we're seeing right now, right? I'm not going to call for a crash. Crash, crashes are super rare. But when it happened then, it happened, as we saw with these, with the previous chart on the stupid rallies and the limited time frame for bears, guess what? 1987, as I mentioned before, was a really quick event that stopped at the yearly five EMA, and that was the low. Uh, which 
if if you look at it in the context of where we are, I don't know what would trigger a crash. Let's say the dollar goes wild. Let's say there is a geopolitical event. You know, all along so it gets stopped out, obviously. But then you you're basically looking at buying again. Why? The flip side of everything the Fed has done in the last year and a half, I think people largely forget that it's kind of in the background because everybody expects higher for longer. They have an awe-inspiring amount of ammunition to cut rates again and to stimulate. I mean, they have a lot more altitude now. Yeah, I mean, imagine, let's, let's just, for argument's sake, we get a 1987-like crash because the chart looks so similar and maybe something freaky happens. I don't know. But let's say it happens. What do you think is going to happen? Everything is out the window. Inflation is done. When you get a massive crash, it's done, right? That's that's when everybody freaks out. And then, then the intervention we saw in March with the banks is just going to be child's play, by the way, which is still ongoing yep. on, on the bank front. Um, that the BTFP, BD- I think, is still at a record high balance right now. Yeah, 107 billion, you know, yay. <laughs> yeah. You know. um, so I can't trade a crash. I can't predict one. You know, I see that similarity in the chart. Let's see how September evolves. It may just disappear as well. Uh, um, and of course, 1987, the crash came from new all time highs. We're not at new all-time highs right now. There's tons of differences in, in anything. I'm just saying, if the worst comes to worst and we have an 87-like type crash, guess what? We're just going to hit the yearly five EMA again, which was which currently sits around 3,900. In 1987, that was the low for years to come. Actually, it's never been touched since. Right? So in that may still end up in being a massive year and uh, and rallies. But my, my I guess my larger message is here, um, basically basically on what I see with everything is that if bears are lucky, and they get a larger pullback in September and October, there is massive support into forty two hundred, into forty one hundred. You know, going back to the February highs, going back to PMAs, weekly fifty MA even the 200 MA or the weekly 100 MA. Um, if if these oversold readings that we saw in August are met with levels like that in September, October, guess what they're screaming? They'd, they'd be screaming positive divergences on the, on the technicals. So, you know, I, I just... Purely technically speaking, I have a hard time making a bear case at this particular juncture. I can I can make a corrective case um, that leads for a pullback in September, October, maybe with a volatility spike. You know, if the VIX goes above that monthly trend line that I mentioned, uh, uh, stays above it, yeah, then then things could change very quickly. You know, but it hasn't happened, and the technical position of this was was very impressive. And then I want to throw in one final point here. And this has nothing to do with technicals, nothing to do with macro. It's kind of a human factor. Because we do have a presidential election next year. Our interview with Sven will continue over in part two, which will be released on this channel tomorrow as soon as we're finished editing it. To be notified when it comes out, subscribe to this channel if you haven't already by clicking on the subscribe button below, as well as that little bell icon right next to it. And be sure to hit the like button too while you're down there. Also, if you haven't yet heard, tickets for the Wealthy on Fall Conference have recently gone on sale. They're now being offered at the early bird price discount of nearly 30% off the standard price. Alumni of our previous conferences get an additional 15% discount on top of that. To lock in these low prices while they last, go to Wealthion.com conference. And if the challenges that Sven has detailed in this interview have you feeling a little nervous about the prospects for your wealth, then consider scheduling a free, no strings attached portfolio review by a financial advisor who can help manage your wealth, keeping in mind the trends, risks, and opportunities Sven's mentioned here. Just go to Wealthion.com and we'll help set one up for you. Okay, I'll see you next over in part two of our interview with Sven Henrik.